Hello everyone and welcome back to another Sunday live chat. I am so happy to see so many of you in the chats and I hope you're doing really well. I hope you have had a really, really great weekend so far. Um, so welcome, thank you so much for joining me. We are gonna start this little mini series um, kicking off talking about the first 10 days of building your ELA workshop. And I do have a little bit of freebie for you guys that I'm gonna give you in just a moment so that you can have it hopefully um, while we are doing this chat here together. So it's going to be a little mini series, essentially talking about all the things we have to do as teachers, all of the strategies, the skills, the routines, everything we want to be able to have our students prepared before we start that first really big unit. Now, for those of you who are new to these live chats, welcome. My name is Bridget Spackman. I am a multi-age teacher in central Pennsylvania, so I teach fourth, fifth, and sixth grade learners across all content areas. I've been doing that for four years now. I've taught previously fourth grade ELA and kindergarten, so many different things, I feel like, uh, but I do really, really love multi-age. I really love multi-age. Um, and recently, I would say maybe over the past two or three years, I've really worked hard on developing a method for reading and writing instruction that allowed me to be able to personalize the education of my students um, and to really hit them where they needed it most. I wanted to give them the instruction that they needed the most, but I also really wanted to really free up some of that time. I felt like I was trying so hard on teaching all of these reading groups and then I was trying to teach all the writing groups and there's just not enough time in the day for me to do that. So um, I worked harder and not smarter and I put both reading and writing instruction together into one that allowed me to be able to make connections with both reading and writing. It made writing more meaningful, it gave it a purpose and it allowed for my students to make those meaningful connections at the end of the day. So. That is called bridging literacy. I love it, it's great, it's fabulous. Um, and I have now recently launched the first unit for fourth, fifth, and sixth grade. So unit one is out for fourth, fifth, and sixth grade. Those are the total units that you can get. Um, but yes, very excited about that. And I'm ready to kind of see what you guys are up to. Hi, how's everyone doing? Oh my word, you guys are like very chatty on the chat today. Chatty on the chat. I don't know. All right, here we go. Um, Brittany Loza says, hey, Tara says, hey, everybody. Hey, Tara, so happy to see you back in that chat. Um, I see Heather. Um, I love Sundays. Michelle from Pocket Full of Primary is uh, in, and Bridget is in the evening. I love that. Pa Michelle in the morning and Bridget in the evening because she launches her videos early in the morning. That is so true and great way to think about it. Um, I see someone from South Carolina teaching eighth grade algebra one. You are brave. Very, very brave. Um, let's see. You guys are doing well so far. So, um, really quick, because I feel like there's a lot of people that I don't really recognize within this chat. And thank you so much for those of you who are already giving this video a thumbs up. I sincerely appreciate it. Um, but because I feel like I have so many new people that are in this chat, I want you to go ahead and let me know, have you started school yet? Like, have you already started school? When are you going back to school? Just let me know um, in the comments. Drop that in right now. Um, I see that Lizzie has a combined fourth, fifth, and sixth grade classroom too. I love that. I feel like multi-age classrooms are becoming more and more of a thing. Um, and really, so many people kind of play it back to the one school room schoolhouse, but it's so much more than that. And I feel as though that as we are in education is really starting to change and it's not so much about identifying kids as a specific grade level, but more so identifying them based off of a range, right? Because kids don't really fall within a box. They can't do that. Um, we have so many different ranges and ages of kids. And so while I may be a multi-age teacher, I really, really urge every single one of you that's out there, whether you teach just one grade level or more multiple grade levels to think of yourself as a multi-age teacher because in reality you're teaching more than just the single grade that you have. You are probably have kids who are on a first or second grade reading level and you're really trying to provide them at those instruction instructional levels. So I, I honestly believe in my heart of hearts every single one of us is a multi-age teacher. Um, 
So somebody in from Texas teaching second grade saying that our first day is on the 20th, going back virtual and then a class um, on the 8th of September. So nervous. Virtual's going, it's going to have its hiccups, I promise you, but I feel like um, with anything else, when we try something new, you are going to be flexible, you're going to make changes, and you're going to make it work, and it's all going to be okay. I, I really do believe that. Okay, so really fast, I want to go ahead and give you guys the link to be able to um, grab the freebie for tonight because I told you guys I did have a freebie for you. So if you want to go to bit.ly uh, forward slash, I see Trent's over here like typing it in, uh, bit.ly forward slash, and then you're going to go to BL10ELA. BL10 ELA um, and okay, there number like now. one zero one zero um, so bit.ly forward slash BL10 ELA and that should take you to where you can download this item for free now it's gonna automatically give you is that not the right one well, hold on. Keep oh okay so that should take you to my store where you're able to grab the first 10 days of ELA workshop. And these are the lesson plans that I'm specifically going to be using. Um, Trent's telling me, no, that's not working. So he is going to try to grab that link from my store and then he can drop it into the chat below so that you guys can go and grab it. Um, do you see it? It's in our store. So, um, this lesson plans, whenever you go and download it, you're going to receive a PDF. And in that PDF document, you're, auto, you're going to have a couple of different links. The first link is going to be to get these lesson plans so that you can automatically start trying them out. Now, what's nice is I'm actually going to give you these lesson plans as the actual slides document so that that way you can edit it a little bit if you feel like you need to edit it. Um, I didn't want to specifically like kind of tie you guys down to exactly how I'm going to be doing it. I want you to think more like general uh, terms of how I'm going to be using these lessons. And uh, today what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to model one of the lessons for you because I want you to have a really good understanding of how we go about building the first 10 days of ELA. Now I need to tell you, um, the, I need to tell you guys my little story about like ELA workshop. And this goes all the way back to kindergarten. So I taught kindergarten and when I first started teaching kindergarten, we went by the daily five give me a hands up an emoji like thumbs up if you or you know someone or you have in the past or you currently are teaching with the daily five um, and this is where you would have the read to self read to someone um, you had your word work you had the listening to read like you had all of these different little stations that the kids would kind of go through in and out well we went by the first 20 days and so when we before we ever built our our ELA workshop, we had to go through the first 20 days of school. Guys, as much as I feel like I loved these first 20 days, it was excruciating <laughs> because every single day in kindergarten, um, and I think I just had kind of like burnt myself out of it because when you have like such a huge class, like I would have almost 25, 26 kindergartners in a class. And I felt like when by the time I had gotten through everybody's name, I was over the name game. So we did things like the name game. We would end up doing a little bitty activities where I would introduce something every single day. And so you slowly, like the idea is to slowly build up reading and writing workshop. So that way you're not just kind of throwing them into it. Instead, you're kind of introducing the routines, the procedures, and all the different little areas um, in the classroom so that they can, so that they can, um, be comfortable with it all. Is it okay? Well, you set it up as a link, so now everybody's requesting. Instead of it's a copy. So it's in the, they're requesting access to the slides. Oh, it's so, wait, huh? I'm not sure. Can, uh, we're gonna put this on pause and I'm gonna put the starting soon on just for a second and let me see if I can get this figured out, please.
Okay, sorry, I had to go and grab my laptop so that I could try it out because I set it down over there. Um, and I didn't want my big booty being all up on the camera. So there you go, guys. Let me see if that link actually works out. I'm gonna go ahead and wait until I see somebody telling me that it does give them some sort of access to it. Oh, you got a lot of technology. Just to let you guys know, this is what your first virtual thing is gonna be like with your students. <laughs> Uh, so let's see if we can get the, all that set up and I got to pull you guys back up so that I can see you. Is it Aaron, working? Aaron said it worked. Yay. Thank you so much. All right. Perfect. Now we're back in business guys. So essentially, like I was saying, the purpose of whole, everything that we do when we're thinking about the building ELA workshop is you're wanting to introduce all the things that they're really going to experience, right? It's building that stamina piece. It's introducing all of the elements so that when they get ready to kind of start with ELA workshop and you're in the middle of your groups, not so much groups this year, maybe you're just doing whole group like I am this year. Um, but if you're in the middle of your lesson, you're not having to stop and reteach and go through all of the different procedures and processes. So here is how I end up thinking about the beginnings of my reading and writing workshop. So you guys know that I essentially take my reading and writing lessons and I put them into one. Well, in the beginning, when kids really first start kind of being introduced to this concept, it's not easy for them to go ahead and start making the connections we have to show them those connections. We have to model those connections for them. And at the same time, and I, I don't know about some of you guys, and you guys can let me know if you are gonna be one-to-one -one this year. I know a lot of districts or in, and counties out there are really looking to just going one-on-one, -on -one -to -one, full-blown at the beginning of the year, whether you're virtual or not. Um, so that way, in case something was to happen, every kid has a device and they're able to utilize it. Plus it cuts down on all the touching of all the things, right? So let me know down in the comments if you guys are going to go ahead and be one-to-one. -one. And with that, um, this process here for me is a lot about introducing technology. I don't like to necessarily do all the technology lessons separate. I like to have them integrated into what it is that I'm doing. So the lessons that I shared with you guys are going to be pretty basic. There's not a ton that's gonna be with it because in my head, I fully anticipate having to tell them, hey, this is how you're gonna turn this assignment in. Let me introduce to you a discussion board and what does that look like? Let me model for you how we're going to go out or how you're gonna sit down or how are you gonna gather materials? How are you gonna go about switching tasks? What do we do when we are done with our assignments? All of those things that we're talking about, the procedures and routines, I talk about it as I'm doing these lessons. So I pick like one or two every single day and I integrate it into the lessons themselves. Does that make sense? Okay, I see a lot of you are going one-to-one, -one, which is pretty much what I, I have in my classroom. I have all iPads in my classroom. My students are gonna be seating in desks this year. So they are going to be separated uh, six feet where feasible, depending on how many students I have that end up coming to class with me. Um, so here's what I've decided to do for this year. When I say bring, bring students together, because you're gonna notice that on day one, right underneath reading lesson, it says bring all students together. Basically that just means I'm, they're gonna stay in their desks. <laughs> they're not moving, they stay in their squares. Everybody has a square. Um, so I want you to kind of think about that as we go through some of these lessons. So um, here are the lessons themselves. This is what they look like. It's in two pages and every single day has a reading, has your objective, it has the reading lesson and the writing lesson. There are a few days in here where the reading and writing lesson are actually uh, meshed together. And the reason for that is because it's just it's a lesson all in one. Um, so for instance, like summarizing, I'm not gonna actually have them go out. I'm gonna do a lesson on summarizing and then they're gonna read, they're gonna try out a strategy for building that information and then they're gonna write. So that's their writing for the day. Um, same thing with synthesizing information. When we talk about synthesizing information, this is how we're gonna go about doing it. And here's how you're gonna kind of share that information. So I really want you to think of it in that form. Okay, so, um, here is 
the layout that I'm doing it this year. Because I want to really help students be able to make the connection between reading and writing, the idea is that we take a reading skill, so every single day I'm going to introduce to them some form of a skill. So as you can see up here, I have what do good readers do, um, and these would be some of the skills that I would teach to them, and actually these are kind of days one through day six. So I would say the first skill that we're going to have is choosing just right books. So how do we do that? Now, um, for that lesson in particular, I, I like to read The Library Mouse. It's a fantastic book. Um, but I will talk to them about choosing just right books online. <laughs> so because we're not going to be actually touching the feet, touching the actual books, we're going to talk about Epic. We're going to talk about um, open ebooks and we're going to talk about Sora, all of the different apps that we have on our iPads to be able to select books and read online. We're going to talk about how to navigate those. We're going to share about how do we select books from there? How do we build our own? Um, what are the books that I really want to read? Because it, it's something that I truly enjoy. So because we're talking about choosing just right books, that writing lesson is connected to that. So just as we as readers go about to find a book that we want to read because we enjoy that topic, we do the same thing as writers. We don't go out and decide, hey, I'm going to write something about chemistry. Well, chemistry may not be my favorite topic at all. And so it's not going to be something that I necessarily would want to write about. So instead, I'm going to think about things that I do really enjoy. And those are the type of stories that I'm going to write. Why? Because it's going to increase my engagement. It's something that I'm passionate about. It's something that I care about and that is easy for me to write. So all the while we're making those connections, we make a list of books that we really enjoy and then we're going to make a list of stories that we might really enjoy writing about. Make sense? Everybody feel good? All right. So day two is going to be all about um, setting goals and reflecting. I am incredibly big on reflecting. I think it is so important for us to reflect and to really set goals. Now, every single year, I always give my students some form of a questionnaire. And over the past couple of years, I definitely have changed it. I do have a resource in my store that has like some questionnaires in there for you to go ahead and give out if you so choose to use those questionnaires. But I give my kids a questionnaire and it basically just kind of probes and ask them questions. What genres do you like? What are some series that you like? You know, where do you like to read? Who do you like to read with? What are some of the books that you've already read this year? So it's something that really kind of gets them thinking about themselves as a reader. But we also want to make sure that we're getting them thinking as themselves as a writer. So I'm going to have them really think about themselves. They're going to reflect using some form of a questionnaire. And we're going to talk about setting goals and what does it mean to set goals. And so when we set those goals, then I'm going to send my students out and they're going to independent read. Now you're probably thinking, okay, so what are you doing the whole time? I'm going around talking with students and listening to them read. I'm pulling information. I'm just watching a lot of the time. Sometimes I just sit and I just watch them. It's kind of creepy, but it's so interesting to kind of see who they are as readers. I like to see how many times they look away from their text, how many times they're constantly looking up, how many, how often are they moving those pages? Because that's going to be indicative of, are they really kind of reading the book or are they just kind of going through them? through it, just looking at the pictures. It tells me so much just by looking at their body language and watching that. So a lot of the times I might just be watching them. I might be talking to them. I might be pulling some kids to be able to do some assessments, or I might just be walking around and listening in as much as I possibly can. But I will be honest, by the time I send them out and, you know, I get them situated, I, you know, bring them back and I kind of talk to them about what we should be doing or what I'm noticing, there's not a ton of time left. So I always feel like, you know, this doesn't seem like a lot, but it's because I'm teaching every little bitty baby step along the way. So there's so many things that I'm trying to hit. And while there may not be a lot in the lesson, I feel like we barely have enough time to be able to go out and do the independent piece. So that's kind of why we end up doing it that way. So Lisby asks, how long is my ELA block? Um, I have ELA for an hour and 20 minutes. Um, so it's about an hour and 20 minutes to an hour and 30 minutes. It truly just depends on how long it ends up taking for us to be able to, um, 
tra like transition, but we're not transitioning this year. So um, if you guys have not seen my last, well, it's no longer up, but if you were not here for my last Sunday live chat, um, one of the big things about my ELA block this year or just my MAC team in general this year is that it's not going to necessarily look like a MAC team because we are going to be kind of constrained to our classrooms. We're not going to be moving around. We're going to have specials, lunch, breakfast, everything is going to be inside of the classroom. Um, it just made sense that between the three teachers that we would just each take a grade level. So this year I'm only going to be taking um, fifth grade. I'm going to teach only fifth grade this year. Uh, it's going to be really sad. It is going to be different, but it's what we have to do. So um, that's kind of it. So with that being said, a lot of our schedules are going to end up changing as well. They're trying to give us plenty of time to be able to go outside. So we have several times, you know, throughout the day where we're able to go out, take our masks off, kind of be social distanced away. So the kids are not constantly with their masks on all day long. So with that, I would say maybe an hour and 20 minutes, 20 minutes is what I'm going to say is like my ELA block that's reading and writing combined. Um, so D3 is going to be all about uh, asking and answering questions. Now this is one of the first like I feel like the first like real skills that we want students to be able to do in reading and writing workshop. So with that I'm gonna actually teach them a strategy for how to ask and answer questions. So we know that there are multiple different strategies to be able to perform a skill. The skill is what good readers are supposed to do at the end of the day but there's lots of different ways to go about doing this. So so I'm going to teach them one of those strategies and I'm using the fantastic blind book um, of Mr. N N Morris Lessmore. Um, it's a fantastic book. It's a lot. It's really good about having conversations and asking and answering some of those questions. So I think it's one that you guys would really enjoy. But like I said, this entire lesson plan is going to be editable. You guys have the slides. You're going to be able to go in, change the stories if you need to change the stories. The entire idea is that every single day you're taking a book, you're reading that book, you're modeling the skill with the strategy, and then you're coming back, you're allowing them to practice, and then you're having a conversation and allowing kids to share. That's kind of the structure of it all. And all the while you're making observations, you're writing things down, you're taking notes, you're you know giving assessments, whatever it may be. Um, but that's essentially how the entire block is structured. So how are you guys feeling about all this? Feeling good? I need to take a drink. I've been talking a lot. It's how these typically work. I talk a lot. So I know a lot of you are saying that you don't really know whether you are teaching remotely yet or if you're going to be teaching in person. I will tell you that even if you're teaching remotely, these lesson plans are will work for you still. Um, the only difference will be that you're not going to really be able to observe students, right? You're not going to be able to have those like back and forth conversations like you normally would. But just like I'm about, I'm going to show you a lesson from the lesson plan so that you guys can kind of get an idea of what it's supposed to look like. But just like I'm about to do this lesson, I would record the lesson, I would post it for them, and I would give them the resources for them to be act to actually be able to complete the assignment. And then I can give them any sort of feedback um, where necessary, but it's the same, same idea. You're just doing it remotely. So you're recording videos, um, but there are, are always kind of those fun moments like when I'm recording a video and I, I sound a little crazy because I'm like, so what do you guys think? And I might pause <laughs> and there's no children around me, but I really want them to kind of get used to giving, getting used to like listening to their own thoughts as I'm asking those questions. Okay. Um, is each day a quick write as opposed to editing a piece? Yes, so each day is gonna be some sort form of a quick write. That very first day when we talk about choosing just right books, and then we're gonna talk about then choosing just right stories for us to write. 
um, that's where they're going to kind of generate a ton of different ideas. And so they can either, you know, continue a piece that they've already started or they're welcome to do a new one. The whole purpose of this is for you to just really kind of see what they do as writers. It just kind of introduces everything for you. It gives you a lot of information. So you're going to be able to kind of pull so many different teaching points off of that for later on when you're getting ready to start your units. Um, but in those, in this, in this very beginning, I let kids to just kind of do what they want to do. And then I just really watch. I don't want to kind of put them down and say, this is exactly what you need to be working on right now. And no, you shouldn't be doing this and you should be over here. Um, I think it's too soon for that. And I really want to kind of introduce that pretty slowly. So allow them to choose. It's kind of free reign at, at, at the very beginning and that's going to be okay. It will give you a ton of information. You start on day one or start with routines? And... Jennifer, I'm glad that you asked that because typically when we start as a school district, we would start on a Wednesday. And so school would start on Wednesday. We would have three full days with our students before the, before the first week of school. In the past, we have taken those first three days and those have been our building relationships and kind of building some of the routines and the procedures, but things were a little bit more normal and we knew about two thirds of our kids because they were just from previous years. So with that, this year, <laughs> we are actually starting school on a Friday. So we only have one full day and with all the health concerns and everything, all the new regulations that we have to have in place, um, my team, we sat down and we just said, you know what, let's just take the Friday and the first full week of school to talk about routines, procedures, building relationships, um, and all of those elements in the very beginning. So these lesson plans, will not actually start for me until the second full week of school. We just felt, felt like it would just be the best. There's just too many things that we have to make sure that the kids are doing and talking about, you know, how we're walking the hall and going to the bathroom, just so many different regulations that we have right now. Um, so Aaron says, how am I going to teach uh, routines and building relationships differently this year? I think I'm not really going to try to teach building relationships essentially necessarily differently. I mean, I'm just going to have to kind of rethink how to engage in conversations and how to engage students with one another, since we're not going to be able to really walk around the room or uh, kids won't be able to kind of have little groups around the room. So I think I'm still going to build in the things that I want them to have. I want them to have eye contact. I want them to stand. I want them to look at one another. I want them to respond back. I want them to be able to share and I want them to ask questions. Um, and to me, a lot of those things, just having interest in someone really builds that relationship. So I don't necessarily, it's more so just rethinking how am I going to go about it? which I don't really know the answer to yet, to be completely honest. That first week of school, I'm not really prepared for. I am prepared for everything after that. <laughs> first week, haven't quite gotten there yet. And that's mainly because I'm still waiting to hear a lot from my school district. Now we're given the first four days uh, with professional development and I can assure you, I'm probably gonna be stuck in a lot of prof like PD that's going to basically outline what I need to be doing that first week. But I mean, we have iPads, so we're going to have different um, apps that we can use. Padlet's a good one, Flipgrid's, Kahoot's, like things like that can still really engage kids. Um, and we can just make the situation light. Like I'm, I am just that teacher that just tries to make really hard things lighter. <laughs> so, um, we'll just have fun with it. We'll come up with some new like shakes and, you know, new chants to cheer kids on. I know back in kindergarten, I did these a lot. I didn't necessarily do them a ton when I was in fourth through sixth grade, but you know, we had like little cheers. So when kids did things really, really great, um, they had one that was like, um, they would put their hands up and they would say, touchdown, it's good. Cause I was in Alabama and you have Auburn, Alabama is just a whole thing of a thing. So the kids really enjoyed that one. So coming up with little chants here and there would really engage kids and get them excited about everything.
Okay. Um, so let's be asked, wait, do you usually teach fourth, fifth and sixth grade at the different times or same time? So Lizby, I actually had several small groups. I never taught whole groups. So for the past going on five years now, I never taught whole group at all. Um, I haven't really taught whole group since kindergarten, kind of weird. Um, but I had small groups all day long. And so I just ran small groups. I would have a fourth grade group, then I would have a third grade group, then I would have a sixth grade group and they would just come in and out of my groups. And that's just really how I structured it. And it worked really, really well for us. Um, I actually enjoy small groups more than I do whole groups um, because I get to engage in conversation so much more. So her question was uh, spurred by the bridging unit units being separated by grade level. Bridging. Why bridging literacy units separated by grade level? So the bridging literacy units are separated by grade level because of the standards that I'm teaching. So I really wanted to make sure that, so when I'm sitting in small group and I have a fourth grader, I need to still teach fourth grade standards, right? Or let's say I have a sixth grader who has just started fourth grade skills because maybe they're on an IEP and they're behind. Um, so if they're starting fourth grade skills, I wanna make sure that I'm using the bridging literacy fourth grade units. It's a progression of reading and writing. So as you kind of see, if you were to look at both the fourth, fifth and sixth grade bridging literacy units next to each other, you're gonna see that every single year gets progressively harder. Yes, they're all doing the same units. They're all working essentially like almost on the same skills, um, but they're all just a little bit different. So fourth grade is typically my introduction year. It's where everything is introduced. Fifth grade is going a little bit deeper by comparing and contrasting. Um, there's a little bit more analyzing that takes place there. And then in sixth grade, we have a ton of analyzing. We have a ton of synthesizing that ends up taking place. And it's really going so much deeper into looking at the events and the why their characters are responding a particular way. Like what is causing those characters to respond that way? Um, so it really builds onto one another. So while I teach like a multi-age, I don't teach them whole group. I teach them by small groups and I teach them small groups based off of those um, reading standards that I have to teach to those students. Does that make sense? Are you teaching virtually at all in the upcoming year? I don't think so. Not unless somebody well, has like another plan. Do you know something? Has someone told you something? Well, I think it's I'm the joking. The school is offering outside yeah. resources. So my school is actually offering um, three different, well, four options essentially. One is full in person. So kids would come to school every single day and have a physical teacher teach them the content. Um, the second option is to have a, 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 a teacher from my school district. That was really hard for me to get out. So sorry, a teacher from my school district in my school who will teach virtually. Does that make sense? So, so essentially there will still be those teachers in the building. There might be like four or five, depending on how many kids end up going virtually, there might be four or five teachers who have no kids in their class all day, but they're in their classrooms teaching online. The other two options are cyber academy options. So these are two cyber academies within our area um, that my district has worked with and pretty much said that if your child goes here, then they will still receive credits for our school district. So all of it will still align. There's not going to be any issues and they can go there. Like they basically like stamp of approval. We recommend these two places. And it really is because the two academy places are gonna be more, um, more personalized and it's gonna be more self-paced. So basically, I don't know if you guys have ever heard of like Odyssey. Um, so it's like a, a an online software basically where the kids are essentially kind of going through the curriculum on their own. Um, so it's, it's things like that versus having a teacher from my district who is teaching them where we're going to be a little bit more asynchronous this year, meaning that we're going to be teaching them. They're going to practice. We're going to teach them. They're going to practice. So everybody's kind of doing the same type of situation, which is very different than what we've had in the past. Very different. Um, so yeah. Okay. So I hope all that makes sense. So 
with these lessons, again, I just want to reiterate that in these lessons, the entire, the flow is pretty much the same. And if you have technology, I encourage you to really think about how do you want your students to submit. So for instance, on day two, if I have a questionnaire, I might try to see if I have that questionnaire either up on Google or I use my LMS, which is Schoology. I would put the PDF up in Schoology and I would teach my kids that day how to submit that assignment instead of taking screenshots, which drives me crazy. So essentially, I would send, teach my lesson, I would send my kids out to go and do it, and then I would bring them back and say, hey guys, now we're all gonna get ready today to submit an assignment. Let's talk about the steps that we're gonna make to submit this assignment. Let me first model for you, and then we're gonna go through it together. And I'm gonna show them how to submit it, and then they're gonna submit it. So that's what I mean about integrating. Um, a different day, let's say it's on, uh, day nine where we're talking about summarizing and I want them to summarize. So I might just put up a discussion board and I might say, Hey guys, today we're going to talk about how to submit something to a discussion board along with our summaries. So today when you go back and you summarize your, your text, you're actually going to summarize it within a discussion post. And this is going to be just another tool that we're going to use throughout the year. So let me show you how I'm going to do that. And then I would model that for them and then they would have to submit it. So everything's going to be integrated into it. Now, if you're allowed to do a little bit more movement, like I said, my kids are in their squares all day long, stay in your square. <laughs> Don't go outside the lines. But if you're able to do a little bit more movement, you would want to teach that movement. How are you going to have them get up and go back? How are you going to, how long are you, do you want them to read? Do you want them to be able to move around the classroom? If you don't, you need to make sure you're telling them that. So all of this stuff is kind of integrated into the lessons. Okay. So the other thing I really want to mention real fast, I don't know if you guys still have your lesson plans up, but on day eight, um, I mention in there because this is called synthesizing, right? I feel like synthesizing is something that teachers are really, really terrified of. They don't like to teach synthesizing. But guys, synthesizing, all it is, is basically taking bits of information from all different places, putting them together to come up with one really big idea. Okay, that's all it is. And so one really great way to teach synthesizing, to get kids to be able to understand what synthesizing is, is to teach it through genres. Now I went on ahead and there's a little hyperlink here and it says genre task cards. I really like this lady. Yeah, it's a TBT thing. You would have to buy it, but I really enjoy these. I think they're good. Um, and so I don't necessarily recommend a ton, ton of TBT products out there. This is what I'm recommending to you. Um, so in this lesson, she, I think there's like 26 or 29 cards. I would break them up by the nine different genres. So I think there's like three or so for each genre. I would read the three and then we would talk about the elements and we'd pull information from all three task cards to be able to come up with the elements of a genre. That's synthesizing. So you're coming up with kind of a bigger understanding, like a generalization essentially. So that's all it is. And I highly recommend teaching it that way. I think kids really get it that way. They understand it a little bit better. Um, and that's kind of my recommendation for the most part. All right, you ready to go through a lesson? I'm ready to go through my lesson. I'm ready. Let's do it. We have 20 minutes, guys. We're going to get through this lesson. and I'm going to show you what I mean um, of what it looks like. So I'm going to model for you day six. Um, day six is one of my favorite lessons in the whole wide world. I love visualizing. Now, typically I have my kids like laying on the floor, their eyes are closed. I turn the light off. I put on music on this in the background, like that, that goes with the story. So I get really into this one. I love, love, love visualizing. Obviously probably not going to happen this year. This all right. So in this lesson, um, I'm going to start, I would have all my students at their desks and I'm going to tell them to put everything away, right? Because this is back at desks. We're going to take everything away. I want your hands up on your desk so that I know that you're paying attention to me, that you're engaged with me and you're listening and focused on what I'm saying. Um, and so then I'm going to really say, Hey, all right guys. So to begin our lesson for today, I'm really excited about this one. It's actually one of my favorite strategies and skills in the whole wide world. And that's visualizing. 
Um, I'm a really visual person. I love looking at pictures. I love, you know, anything that I can kind of see what's happening. When I learn, I learn visually. I have to see what you're doing in order to really understand it. So today we're gonna to talk about this skill called visualizing and we're gonna add it to our What Do Good Readers Do uh, anchor chart. So I've already read, uh, written it down here for us and we're gonna really chat about what is visualize. Now I want you to think for just a second, okay? I want you to go ahead and take your iPad down and I really just want you to, you're gonna click on, I'm gonna tell them to go to a Padlet, I might tell them to do certain things and I might introduce this to them if I have to. So go to a palette, I want you to write down what you think visualize means. So as they're doing that, I can go to my anchor chart. So my students are in their padlets, they're doing their things, I'm starting to see it, I'm starting to kind of call people out. Oh, I see that such and such person said this, I see that such and such person said that, fantastic. All right guys, now I want you to go ahead and turn your iPads off. And sometimes guys, this is like one of my tricks, but if my kids have their iPads, I will tell them to flip it and put it at the top and the edge and then have their hands here. So that's one of the things that I like to do just to make sure that they are not looking at it and touching their iPads. I tell them to flip it, turn it over, and I don't want them to see, I don't want to see the screen at all. So in case I need them to pull it back out to engage in the lesson again, um, they have it quickly right there and then we can keep moving. So I'm gonna say, okay, so before I read my book to you, which I am very excited about this book, the book is called The Seashore Book. Um, and I really liked this book because recently I just went to the beach. How many of you with a show of hands have gone to the beach this summer? And I might have some kids, I know a lot of my kids go to the beach. So we live about three hours. And so they're all gonna raise their hands, right? Not all, maybe some. Okay, so I'm gonna put this book down. I said, but before we get to read this really exciting book, I really wanna talk about what it means to visualize. So what is this? Now I saw on your Padlet, as some of you were putting in the discussion, here's kind of what you guys said, and you get it. You're exactly right. As readers read stories, they listen to words and they make pictures in their mind. That's why this little boy right here has like a thinking bubble around the word visualizing because he's thinking about it in his mind. So we know what it is, but why do we do it? What's the purpose of it? Why do we even care about trying to visualize as a reader? Well, it really helps us to better understand events that are happening in story. When we're able to kind of make pictures in our minds, we can see those events and it just kind of makes connections with us. We can understand them better. And then it allows us to really place ourselves into the character's shoes. And what I mean by this is that you're kind of experiencing what the character is experiencing. You're feeling what the character is feeling. You might be thinking what the character is thinking before they even think it. So that's why we do this as readers. So how? This is blank. You're like, whoa, why is this blank? Because I'm gonna model this for you today, okay? So I told you I was excited about my book. We're gonna read the Seashore book, all right? So I would go through and I might read this book to them, obviously, this book is really cute. Um, I'm actually gonna read a couple of pages for you just so that you can get a gist of it. Um, so I have a very, very like, um, like deep connection to this book because my teaching partner who passed away um, a year ago, this was one of her books that she recommended to me when we first started the Mac team. So it was a book that I definitely needed to get and put into my library. So here's the seashore book. What is the seashore like? A little boy asked his mother. He lived in the mountains and had never seen the sea. His mother smiled. Well, let's pretend, she said. It is early morning at the seashore and it's hard to tell where the sea stops and where the sky begins. They are the same smoky gray until the mist shifts from gray to dark white, from dark white to pale purple, from pale purple to hazy blue. And then suddenly the sun breaks through. It warms the cool sand. It turns the sea green and the beach is golden gray. 
you run down to the water's edge, one small dark spot against the brightness of the sand and sea. You bend over and pick up a stone washed smooth by the sea. You find tiny brown snail shells and oyster shells, crusty gray outside and smooth, pearly pink inside. You pick up a clam shell half open and inside a live clam snaps the shell closed. In my hand, the little boy asked. In your hand, the mother said. So the mom essentially kind of goes through and describes what it's like to be at the sea. Um, and so mom just kind of goes through the different events that he might experience there and it's really good for having kids visualize. So it's up to you on whether you wanna kind of share the images of it or if you wanna just kind of hide the book and only have really allow kids to visualize it. But as I visualize this and as I would go about teaching this, I would say, okay guys, so I'm gonna model for you what it looks like to visualize. So watch me as I visualize and as I read, I'm gonna stop and I'm gonna pause and then I'm gonna say, hey guys, I wanna reread some of these because I'm already starting to get a picture in my mind. I'm developing an image in my mind and what is that called? And the kids are gonna tell me, visualize. Perfect, that's what it's called. So as I visualize, here's what I'm thinking of, and I'm gonna reread certain parts because these are the clues that are allowing me to visualize. So the mom starts to really kind of tell you that you can't see where the ocean stops and where the sky begins. So the ocean and sky connect. And I'm gonna write blend. And I might even ask, what does that mean? What does it mean that they blend together? And I might have a few kids end up sharing for me. And again, when I'm doing this, I'm teaching them to stand up, I'm teaching them to talk out loud, I'm teaching the kids to look at one another so that we're engaging with one another, but we're also learning those essentials that I really find to be important within my classroom. And then I'm gonna start there and I'm gonna say, well, I can also tell that the author says that there is dark white. We have pale purple. All of these are words that I'm listening to as I was reading that's allowing me to kind of visualize and think of what this, is, this really looks like in my mind. And so on the dark edge, on, you run down the water's edge, so uh, water edge to sand. And it's up to you here what you would like to do. Sometimes I would draw pictures. So a dark spot. And I might have some different colors here as I can kind of draw the sky and the ocean kind of coming together. But I'm pulling it out and I'm modeling it. And then I might then have the kids, and again, this is where you can describe some sort of technology. So as I find another page and I'm like, okay, now I want you guys to try. So here's what I'm gonna have you do within a Padlet or maybe I have Flipgrid or something for them to be able to engage with technology wise, because again, we're not gonna be able to move around or you can have kids just be able to, sometimes I will even have them use their iPads as a whiteboard. So um, if you've ever heard of the app, explain everything, I will have them open up an app, they can write words down and they, they can hold it up. Um, and that's an easy whiteboard for me to be able to have within the classroom right there. And then they would be able to kind of tell me different parts from another section of that story. So once I'm done with that, and I've kind of walked them through it, I've given them feedback, they've had an opportunity to practice, I've modeled it for them, I'm gonna tell them, all right guys, so here's what we're gonna do today. So today as you go back out, I really want you to think about what this means to visualize, what it means to visualize. And I really want you to work on using this skill today. Now think about the strategy that I've used here where I've basically taken a circle, I've looked for words, and I've had my image here, but then I write those words all around the outside. Some of them are inferences, others are taken directly from the text, but it's here. So then I'll tell them today as you go back out, you're gonna open up your independent reading books. 
I'm going to be coming around and listening to some of you. Stop it. I'm going to come around and start listening to some of you read independently. Um, and I really want you to visualize. So I'm going to have you use, you know, whatever piece of technology that I want them to use to visualize. And then when we're done, I'm going to have you guys share what you were able to visualize from your own stories. Now, yes, they are doing this from their independent reading book. Now, I want them to try it with their independent reading book. And the way that I do this whenever we come back together is I tell them, all right, guys, so listen, as you were reading your independent reading books, I'm going to have you guys share, a couple of you shared today. And when you come to share, I really want you to think about, um, I, want, I really want you to think about how you're going to share the story. We need to kind of understand what is it that you're reading. So I want you to tell us what the book title is. I want you to give us kind of the gist of where you are in your story and then tell us where, what you were able to visualize. So they might say, okay, so um, I was reading the book Wolf Hollow and in that story there is a girl named Betty and she's a bully. Um, and in the story, the author starts to describe where they are in the woods. And so they're talking about Toby and where he lives and his little shack. And so I was able to use the words blank, 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 blank to be able to visualize this. Fantastic. Thank you so much for sharing. Moving on. So they tell me the title of the story, a little just about what they were reading, and then they were able to tell me how they used that skill and strategy. So I would let a few kids share. And then after that, I tell them, okay, guys, we might end up doing stretch breaks because bless these babies for having to sit in the chair. So I might say, everybody up, let's do stretch, let's stretch, let's do whatever we need to do to get our bodies moving, sit back down. Okay, so just as good readers use this strategy of visualizing, writers use it too. So we really have to kind of make connections of how we can really learn from our authors as we read and pull it into our writing because that's how we learn. We learn by people who have already done it. And so we're using um, Charlotte Zaletto <laughs> as our example for what we should be doing in our own writing. So today, what we're gonna do is we're gonna talk about visualization and how it really helps us to be writers. And so one of the things that we're doing is we're really just talking about show versus tell sentences. That's all visualizing is. She doesn't tell us what we're, that what the characters were doing. No, she's helping you paint a picture in your mind. So let me show with you guys exactly how we go about taking a tell sentence and making it a show sentence. So here we have, I was hot. Great, but I want you to show it to me. So here's what I mean by that. If you were to look at me and I was really, really hot, Explain to me what I would look like. I would have sweat dripping. My cheeks might be really red. Um, I might like have this like, like breathing heavy. I might be breathing heavy. My shoulders might be hunched over. I might have whew, my hands on my head. That's more of just me being out of shape, I feel like. But you know, they go hand in hand sometimes. Um, but all of those are indicative of me being hot. So instead of saying, I was hot, I could instead say, as the sweat rolled down my cheek, I leaned over desperate desperate echo alexa computer what <laughs> to catch my breath and yes i do have an echo in my classroom so that when i don't remember how to spell something i can literally ask echo in my class i let my kids use it too i feel like i'm pretty nice about that um, but that would be an example, okay? And again, I would have their iPads flipped over and then I would say, all right guys, I might try to have them do it, all right? So they might even be able to, I'm gonna cross my fingers. I don't know how this is gonna work because I haven't been in my classroom yet. Guys, I can get into my classroom this week. Shock. Um, I might have them just turn to the person next to them or somebody turn around to turn and talk. 
all right? So I'm still gonna try to use those strategies. I'm gonna cross my fingers and hope it works, but I'm gonna have a backup plan just in case. So I might tell them to turn and talk about how they can change I Heard Birds into a show sentence, and then I'll have them pick up their iPads, use that app, and they're gonna write it out and hold it up. Or I might have them use Padlet or use the discussion board. Again, this is where I'm trying to teach the technology that I need for them to be able to learn and use appropriately. So once I do that, I'm gonna tell them, all right guys, so we have been really working with some of our stories. Some of you are continuing to write the stories that you've already been, you've already started, and that's okay. You're welcome to continue working on those stories. And some of you are choosing to begin a new story. Today, as you go out to begin writing, I really want you to think about how you can take those tell sentences and make them into show sentences. Think about how this author, the mom in this story, really was able to show her, um, her son what the sea really looked, feels, sounded, um, and what they heard. So I want you to try that strategy out. And then when we come back, um, I'm gonna have a couple of you sh share some of the sentences that you've used in your own stories. So send them out. I would do whatever I'm supposed to be doing bring them back together and allow them to share. So that's kind of the structure for the entire day. That's what I'm gonna do for my ELA block. Um, I hope you guys enjoyed my lesson. <laughs> it's fantastic. So once we're done with that, the next day I would come back um, and then this one, I have to use the same color because I'll be weird about that. I'm gonna check it off and then I'm gonna have our next skill here ready for them to um, practice for that day. And again, it follows the same process, except for the days where reading and writing is combined. Because for instance, summarizing, they're already gonna be writing. Writing is a lot about putting down the thoughts onto paper, making sure that it makes sense and that it's in a progressive order. So I won't necessarily have them go back out and write. There's gonna be lots of little steps that I'm gonna have them do between that lesson. Um, but yeah, okay, so that's it. That's the gist, guys, what do you think? Oh, G. Rod loved my lesson. Thank you. Um, good. I'm so glad that glad that you guys enjoyed the. I go really simple. I am not super fancy with my lessons, um, but I do like to make connections with my students, and I do um, like to make it meaningful for them. So this was kind of short, sweet, simple to the point. But again, you're teaching so many different things that you, at the very beginning of the year and you're wanting to make sure that they're doing it correctly. So if you have to stop them and say, hey guys, we didn't do that properly. You know, I still see that some of you are playing with your iPads. So let's talk about what that's supposed to look like. And then I would say our iPads are supposed to be flipped and then on the edge. So let's all try that together. Everybody grab your iPad. All right, flip it. Put it on the edge. Where do your hands go? Show it to me. So if you have to stop and do that, that's totally fine. That's the purpose of having very simple ELA workshop beginning of the year lessons so that you're able to teach those things. Um, so you guys have the lesson plans. If you have not grabbed them already, the link is there um, with at the very beginning of the chat please go ahead and grab the lessons and you are able to really edit them if you choose to pick different stories than I have chosen. Um, these are just books that I, I tried to choose some of the books that I, ha I don't use in my units because I use a lot of books in my unit plans. So I tried to pick out some of the books that I wasn't already using in my unit plans. Um, and these are just some of my favorites. Like I said, I just really enjoy them. Which another one of my favorites, I have to share this one with you guys. So another one of my favorites is this new one that I got. <laughs> I can't remember if I shared this one already. Uh, I love Saturday y Domingos. I am really excited about this book. Now I know probably not every teacher out there will want to read it because it has English and Spanish in it. Um, but I felt like this really like touched my heart. Um, so like we have on Saturdays, I go visit my grandma and grandpa, grandma and grandpa are my father's parents. They are always happy to see me. I say, hi grandpa, hi grandma, as I walk in and they say, hello, sweetheart, how are you? Hello, darling. I love this part. I spend los domingos with abuelito and abuelita. Abuelito and abuelita are my mother's parents. They are always happy to see me. I say, hola abuelito, hola abuelita. 
as I get out of the car. And they say, hola, hijita, como estas? Hola, mi corazón. So it kind of talks about the, the relationship going back and forth. It's great. So if you want to work on your Spanish from back in high school or college, or you're like me and you already know Spanish, <laughs> I recommend this book very, very much. Um, okay. Should we add those to the Amazon store? Yes, I will definitely add these to the Amazon store. Um, one of the other books that I picked for this one is Miss Rumpheus is a, another book that I absolutely love. Um, it's just, it has such a good message in the story itself, so it's one that I enjoy tremendously. Like I said, the Seashore book is another one of the ones that I have into this one. And then I'm also, I'm looking for it, Library Mouse is one from the very beginning, the first day. It's a really good book. Again, another one of the ones that my teacher partner recommended to me. Um, and I love it. It's a great book. And I was digging in my basement. <laughs> if you guys would see my basement, you would be terrified. Um, I have a lot of stuff in my basement. But what, I found this book and it's so cute. And I feel like I've seen a lot of teachers online and they're sharing, I think it's a, a picture book called hair love. Am I right? Yeah, Trent already knows it because he sees it when he goes through Instagram. So a lot of teachers are sharing hair love. And when I was down there, I found this one, which I think is like, this one came out before hair love did. Um, but it's very, very similar. It's about a little girl who she talks about loving her hair. But what I love about this story, and I used it in kindergarten. I mean, bless it. One of my babies like, ruined this page um but what i love about this story is that it's such a small moment it's literally about this little girl who's getting her hair brushed talk about small moment i love it i love 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 it i try to pick very small moments to get my students to really expand them and make them bigger stories um, and i love this as an example for that so good um, so yeah, lots of picture books everywhere, I feel like. But some, those are some of the favorites that I have going on right now. Um, all right. All right, there were a couple questions. Okay. Oh, uh, Liz, or Lizzy, asked about what the rest of your students are doing when you're doing small groups. Uh, in a in, in pre-COVID pre -COVID world, <laughs> uh, pre-COVID, my students are either reading um, they're engaging in a practice from the lesson itself. They are responding to reading or they're writing independently or they might be um, completing some sort of a book talk. Now, next week, next Sunday, guys, I'm going to go into sinners or no sinners. <laughs> it's the big, huge, controversial topic, I feel like. I think a lot of people like sinners because of the fact that it's very structured. And so you kind of have a hand at making sure that kids are doing what they're supposed to be doing. Um, I don't use sinners. In fact, I took sinners away back in kindergarten. Can you believe that? Five-year-olds, five-year-olds, no sinners. Um, and I loved it. I, I was so happy when I got away from sinners. One, because I'm lazy. You got, I say it a lot. I am lazy and I don't like to do a ton of work. Here's the thing. Let me reword that. I'm lazy and I don't want to do work that's not meaningful. Um, and to me, sinners were not meaningful. Now, I think that you can structure it in a way that makes them meaningful. Um, but that's what we're going to talk about next Sunday. So I'm not going to, I'm not going to share it all with you right now. Why would I do that right now? I'm going to share it with you next Sunday. So come back next Sunday and we'll talk about that. So Kathleen had a comment about liking BLC, but, oh, Bridging Literacy Series, so you're going to have to reread this probably, okay. has been very, super helpful, but it's been tough switching age groups and having admins who don't know how to help like mentors as supportive as they might be. Okay, she's so... from a small Catholic school, I think she said. So Kathleen says, <clears throat> Bridging Literacy series has been super helpful so far, but it's been tough switching age groups 
and having admin who don't know how to help like mentors as supportive as they may be. I completely understand. And I think that's probably one of the hardest things as an administrator is that with education moving, and I think we are moving at a much faster rate than we have any of the previous years because we've been thrown into this world of COVID, right? So we're moving incredibly fast in education. And because administrators are so busy dealing with all the other chaos that is happening out there, like God bless them. Like I'm so grateful for them. I would never be an administrator ever. Um, but they are so far removed from the classroom that they don't necessarily know how they would go about um, making this change into the classroom. So I get it. I know that that's really, really difficult. And a lot of it is just trial and error. And I am really big that if something's not working, I'm not going to keep doing it and I'm going to change it. And more than anything else, I encourage you to go into reading books, lots of professional development books. There are some really fantastic ones out there. If you want to start with maybe the book whisper or reading in the wild, that kind of gives you a general, like, here's what reading should look like. The writing thief is also another fantastic read that I would recommend that really allows you to understand, okay, I need to use writing as with mentor text. Um, and bridging literacy, all it's doing is taking these, these strategies, the things that we already know about what teaching should look like, and we're putting it together into one lesson. So um, it's just a different way of approaching your mini lessons versus having them separate. Do you guys hear my kid and my dog? like running and he's giggling and he and the dog runs again and then bling giggles again and it's like constant. <laughs> Um, so I understand, I would encourage you to do that. Um, if you're not part of the bridging literacy community, I do encourage you, encourage you to be a part of that community. There's some amazing educators there. We have live chats that we've started doing to be able to have conversations like that and talk about some of the problems. Um, and I do every once in a while, I will have phone calls that I will do with bridging literacy members. So. I highly recommend that you join the community, if anything else, just to have a good supportive community who are all trying to do the exact same thing. Um, I think there's some really good benefits with it. Okay. Guys, thanks for being so supportive on my lesson. You guys are so nice. I should do lessons with you guys more often. Y'all make me feel good. <laughs> um... Let's see. I'm waiting. Joe says, I love the Saturdays in the Wingles book. It's awesome. It is so awesome. I love it. Um, so Carrie, bridging literacy, I have a couple of different things. So um, there is the series. There's a 10 part series that I started doing to kind of promote and get the word out about bridging literacy, but also to really kind of support you guys and, and get you thinking a little outside of the box of what reading and writing instruction should look like. I think we've all kind of been taught this, they need to be taught separate because we're trying to reach a score, right? Kids are not scores. Kids need connections. Brain-based research tells us that in order for kids to be able to process that information and to retain the information, they need to make connections. And reading and writing is one of the hardest things to make connections with. But when we combine it together, that allows us to connect that so much easily, much more easily for students. And when you think about it, and here's kind of my whole pitch, reading is the analyzing, the understanding, the learning, Writing is the application of that. So before I can go out and I can write a story with plot, I need to know what plot is. I need to be able to analyze it. I need to look at what authors are doing. I need to look at how they're doing it so that when I go to write, I have a clearer understanding of what's expected of me. So that's kind of what this entire bridging literacy is based off of. It's about 
having the understanding, building the knowledge so that kids can then go and apply it into their writing. In my opinion, when I first started fourth grade, I had no idea what writing was supposed to look like. In fact, I'm pretty sure I just kind of won it. Like, won it? Winged it? Is that a, is that a winged word? It. Winged it? Winged it. This doesn't seem right. That doesn't seem right. But I, I was winging it the entire time because I didn't know what what it was, it was what was it supposed to look like at the end of the day? What, when did you know if it was finished? How did we go about finishing it? Like, who answers all those questions? <laughs> so that's when I really started noticing the connections to reading instruction. And then I started to develop these units. The units help you to understand the purpose for writing. And I think when we understand our purpose for writing, we as teachers have a clearer picture of what our lessons need to look like. So that way, somebody mentioned in there, and thank you for the very sweet comment, about it being like to the point, like it, it was a very like, here's what you're doing. That's how our instruction needs to be all the time. And with writing, I feel like a lot of the time we were just like, all right, you're gonna go, we're gonna write a story. <laughs> And it's like a personal narrative. And let me teach you what a personal narrative. And now you're going to go out and write it. And it's like, but how? So this is why we have so many kids who are so frustrated with writing instruction because it's so, what do I do? Where do I go? How am I supposed to do it? And yeah, we do many lessons, but again, I feel like they're so far removed. It's like, but wait, where, what am I doing? Like, what is this supposed to look like by the end of the day? <laughs> And so that's why I developed Bridging Literacy because I needed a clearer picture of what it was supposed to look like so that I could help support my students so much more. So Hope Jennifer's pretty already covered you on this one, but Erica asked, what grades is Bridging Literacy available for? Can it be modified to be used in six to eight resource classroom kids with primary learning disabilities? And Jennifer basically said yes and explained why, but I didn't know if you'd want to add anything to that. Yeah, I'm looking at her responses. <clears throat> so someone asked about using bridging literacy, like what grades I have it available for. So right now, I am only developing them for fourth through sixth grade. So four, five, and sixth grade, I have unit one done right now. Unit two is gonna be done uh, a little closer towards the end of the month. So I'm gonna start it this week. Um, and then my plan is to have all six units done by January of 2021. Um, so then that way you have all the units to finish out the rest of the year. Once I finish fourth through sixth grade, I'm gonna start working on developing a third grade curriculum. Now, yes, you can modify them. Um, and yes, absolutely, bridging literacy works in all grades. It's all about making connections, which kids need. And, um, <laughs> I love that. <laughs> you never know. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so it works in all grade level and I highly recommend using it if you're doing some form of a resource room. Um, in fact, we have a bridging literacy member in my community who it works in middle grades and she is utilizing and she's taking actually two different units and combining them to make it fit the needs of her students. So she has students who are on like a second, third grade, fourth grade reading level. So what we've done, and I've worked with her a little bit on this, is taking the fourth grade unit and the fifth grade unit, and you're taking lessons out of that unit and you're combining them because they're both personal narratives. So in order to make sure that you're kind of hitting what I would call power standards, the most important standards that you feel like they just need to get to get them moving, we don't wanna hold them back every single year. The purpose is to catch them up as much as possible, right? So not every lesson is gonna be necessary. You can pick and choose the lessons that you would consider power lessons. And she's combining the two grade levels in order to make sure that she's fitting the needs of her students. So it is absolutely doable. This, this method is so uh, flexible, I guess is the right word, right? Flexible? It is flexible. Um, so yes, I highly recommend it. Not because I created it, although I feel like I maybe am a little biased, but I do love it. I really do. 
And guys, I say this all the time. If you watch the 10 part series, if you really understand it, you don't need to buy my unit. Go out and do it. Start bridging literacy, get the word out. Tell people I'm using the bridging literacy method, but I'm doing it the way, like with my own little twist. That's okay. You're taking the essential components of what bridging literacy is and you're kind of putting it together and you're doing it in your classroom. You don't necessarily have to use the units. Now, the units are there mainly to basically help you if you need help and getting your feet off the ground, essentially. And once you do that, um, you can kind of put your own little twist to it. You can make it you um, while also sticking to kind of the essential components of what it is. So, all right. Well, guys, it is 8.17. I always go by like later than eight o'clock. Um, I am gonna be planning on doing multiple grade levels, but you have to remember, I still teach. Um, and I still teach, I'm still in grad school. Yeah, I'm, I'm in grad school, in guys. I got projects, I teach, I'm a mom. Like, so do a podcast? I do a podcast. Why do I do so much stuff? Um. I have a podcast. I have kids who are now going to be at home three days a week versus all, you know, be gone all at school for all five days. I have a lot that's on my plate. So as much as I, I want to say that I'm going to have it all done, I can't make promises. I absolutely think I'm going to do that one day, but I don't want to go away from teaching. Like I like teaching. I enjoy it very much. So I could definitely be one of the teachers that left the classroom and just sat here and wrote curriculum all day. Um, I would probably go crazy and I would drive my husband nuts. <laughs> so I still love teaching. I love the interaction. I love being with my students and engaging with them and seeing the difference that of what I'm doing in the classroom. I enjoy that a lot. So. I'm going to try. I will try. <laughs> All right. I am tired and I still have work that I need to do. <laughs> A lot of work, actually. I did nothing yesterday, guys. Nothing. You know what I did? I went to Ikea and I stood in the line and it was a horrible and I got nothing I at Ikea. Nothing. <laughs> I bought nothing at Ikea. Oh. And it's an hour and a half drive. Hour and a half. And I got nothing. Such a fail of a trip. <laughs> All right. Guys, make sure to give this video a thumbs up. If you are new to my channel, I um, would love it if you were to subscribe. Go ahead and hit the notification bell so that when I do go live or I upload a random video, because I do upload random videos every once in a while, you will see that I upload a video. Um, you'll get notified that I've done so. And yeah, give the video a thumbs up. I thank you so much for joining me. I am so beyond grateful that you guys see the benefits of what bridging literacy could do for you, do for your students, and that you believe in me and in this method. And it just, it really does touch my heart every single, um, every single Sunday. So you guys bring the energy back into me and I hope that I'm able to give a little bit of energy back to you. So thank you all so much. For those of you who are starting school this week, tomorrow, good luck. You got this. Deep breathe, <laughs> take a step at a dime, and smile and just enjoy being with your students. It's gonna be okay. I know some of you are coming up with some real big challenges, um, and I am gonna be thinking of you guys this coming week. So all the best to all of you, and I hope to see you next Sunday where we're gonna talk sinners or no sinners. Thank you so much for watching, guys, and I'll see you later. Bye. Oh, I can't find the screen. <laughs>